Welcome back to Green Box Politics, Episode 3. And I am your host, Red Stick Mirage, also known as Blackbeard Mirage. So this evening's subject may be a brother that some of you all are familiar with if you keep up with street culture and street history. And also if you have seen the movie Paid in Full, starring Makai Pfeiffer, Woody Harris, and Cameron from Dipset. All right. So this evening's subject will be on the brother Alpo Martinez, also known as Poe, or Alpo in the streets. And what we will do is use paid in full as a backdrop. We will look in paid in full and see what is factual and what is consistent with some of the history, you know, as it pertains to Mr. Martinez. And we will also use this basic Wikipedia for those that, you know, may have not heard of him and you can get some background information on him. But what I'm going to do my best to do is to paint the picture of basically the brother's street career and detail certain things that, you know, was in the movie. And, you know, in the comment section, we'll all see if we think the movie was consistent with what happened in real life. All right. So the first thing we want to do is we want to read from Wikipedia to get some basic information on Mr. Martinez a.k.a. Alpo. <clears throat> Alpo Martinez, better known as Alpo Martinez, or simply as Poe or Alpo, he was born on June 8th, 1966, and the brother died October 31st, 2021, was an American drug dealer from Harlem, New York City of Puerto Rican descent. Martinez rose to prominence in the mid-80s. In addition to New York, Martinez expanded his drug trade to other cities, notably Washington, D.C. Something I find very interesting about Alpo is he was actually born a day before me. You know, my birthday is June 9th. His is June 8th. So some of that Gemini Machiavellian mentality, trickster mentality, I can see that expressed in Mr. Alpo's character just as I do myself. So as we all know, Eventually, uh, Mr. Alpo was convicted of murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and various drug charges, as it says. And he was locked up on November the 6th, 1991, where he was caught in Washington, D.C., okay? So instead of going through this and reading this basic information, because some of this will come up in um, future Green Box Politics episodes, but what we will do right now is we will go ahead and get deeper into this brother's story and look into his career, all right? Now, most of this information I got is from various articles, interviews that Mr. Alpo has done himself. So it's not like I'm making any of this up. Also, for those that were involved in this situation in New York, maybe from New York, from Harlem, from that area, and either directly or indirectly was affected by these situations because, you know, there were a lot of negative experiences with this you know a lot of deaths um, people lost finances and people were in prison so i just want to say you know peace and power to those people and for those that were deceased from this situation you know whether they deserve to die or not rest in power to those souls and the spirit of those people because at the end of the day all this you know is part of aboriginal american culture and you know telling the stories that melanated americans go through in particular in mainland North America, the streets of the United States of America. So to go into Alpo's story at first, you know, the brother Alpo, it seems like he always was a hustler, even in his youth. And according to him, you know, during certain summer, he, he, he used to go stay with certain Caucasian families during the summertime. Um, but I think he was on probation and he was going to move with one of these families because I think they lived in a better environment. Maybe they lived in upstate New York. And when Alpo was up there, he got to experience different things. So it would be almost like if you somebody that's growing up in the hood, not many resources. Like I talked about on a prior tape when I was getting on a lot of these so-called black elders and how a lot of the youth, you know, we can't play basketball because the streets are messed up. We don't have no money to go to, you know, the local court or facility. We don't have no ride. We don't have no money to go get no water, no Gatorade after we play ball. So when you grow up in the so-called black community, even though you may go outside to engage in certain recreational activity, 
you know, a lot of times it's limited to, you know, how fun it can be. So Alpo got to experience the other side of life when he can go and hang out with, you know, um, Caucasian, you know, families. And I'm sure he made a lot of friends, too. So but I can remember the brother stating that his mother was going to probably allow him to move up there or prolong his stay. But the probation officer that he had that was in New York City rejected that. And Alpo even made a statement himself that he thinks that had he been able to go stay with those Caucasian families and extend his, you know, his network out there, it may have saved him from some of the things he got involved in the streets. All right. So the brother Alpo, you know, he grew up in New York City, grew up in Harlem. And in the streets, you know, initially he he found out about AZ. Now, AZ and Peyton Full was a guy played by uh, Woody Harris. And AZ was already on in the streets. You know, he already had his connect, you know, when he was in the movie, they show you when he was um, washing clothes and he uh, worked at like a um, a laundry cleaner facility or a dry cleaner facility. And basically there was a, I don't know if the guy was of Puerto Rican or Dominican descent, but basically this is who um, AZ had as a plug. And he was, you know, giving AZ the bricks. So AZ already had his own money and had his own little operation going on. And now Paul seeing this, you know, he basically stepped to AZ and wanted to get put on, you know, wanted to try to get some money himself in the street so he could, you know, I guess, get some of the things he wants and start to grow as a man. And also during the 80s, a lot of these brothers in New York were getting involved in the streets very, very young, extremely young, um, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 years old. A lot of these guys was already getting knee deep into the streets. You know, the drug gang, big kilograms of cocaine and heroin, you know, murders, shootouts, gang warfares, drug gang warfares, etc. So it really was no different with Alpo. So, you know, eventually he met AZ and um, AZ began to work with the brother and eventually he put him on. AZ had a program basically where, you know, he would take the bricks of the cocaine and he would bust them down in ten dollar bottles, you know. So at this time period, they were dealing with the powder cocaine. It wasn't the crack yet. And also, before I go deeper into this, you got to remember, too, that not only were these young guys getting in the streets early, but during this time period of, you know, the, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, a lot of these young men, their parents were addicted to drugs. Their parents was addicted to cocaine, crack and heroin. So there was no parental guidance. Now, I'm not saying that this was Alpo's case, but I think with Rich Porter, I do. I believe his mother was a drug addict. So we all know Rich Porter was in knee deep in the streets as well, probably around these same ages. OK. So Alpo and AZ, you know, hook up and AZ begins to put Alpo on with these ten dollar bottles of the you know powder cocaine. But we got to remember that AZ's personality, or at least in the movie and in interviews that I've seen with him. You got to remember in the streets, you got different art types of men. So you got those that are hustlers, those that may be business minded or executive minded, but they may not be as aggressive and violent. And then you got those guys that are enforcers, very violent. And, you know, they're, they're quick to either fight, stab or shoot. So, you know, sometimes you have those guys where you have two and one. You have a man that may possess both of those attributes. And that's how Alpo was. Alpo, not only was he a hustler, but. Alpo didn't mind laying the murder down either. But AZ, from what it looks like me being on the outside looking in, AZ was more about his money. So, you know, certain aggressive behavior, um, he wasn't really known for that in the streets. And what happens is, is that you're going to start attracting wolves and other predators in the streets and particularly stick up kids. That's what they call them up in New York. Jack boys, the robbers, the finessers, the jug man. Whatever you want to call it, but those guys that are enforcers, they may not be that clever. They may not, you know, be as arithmetic and numerical, but they know how to, you know, instill fear in people. So AZ started to attract these guys and he was being shot at and a lot of his spots were being robbed. And this is where, you know, Alpo noticed this and he started to, you know, push up on AZ and say, hey, man, look, you know, we need to get these guys up off of you. Um you know, and start shooting back and letting them know, like, we're not playing. Like, nobody's going to just be able to run up in our spots and, and take dope from us or take money and be extorting us. Alpo wasn't going for none of that. So initially, when he got in with AZ, he was doing, you know, a little bit of hustling, but he was also the enforcer. And you saw that it paid in full as well, because I think AZ had a couple of guys that were stealing from him, um, basically taking his bottles and like switching them out, probably stepping on some of the product. 
etc you know um uh, upcharging so they can make a little bit more so let's say if az was selling them really for 10 but maybe they selling them for 15 so they capping five dollars things of that nature you know and a lot of that is disloyal you know so az you know caught on to it and then eventually alpo caught wind of this so they started to you know beat guys up and according to alpo he even tried to throw a guy out the window and hang him so you know, Alpo was willing to show that, hey, you know, AZ got some muscle behind him. We're not weak and we're not going for that. So, you know, as as AZ, you know, Alpo starting to work together, you know, um, he's taking these keys and breaking them all the way down. You know, just like they showed you in Paid in Full, like these guys will have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of those little small bottles. And they would take that full key and break it all the way down. So that took a lot of patience and a lot of time. But Alpo said he was willing to do that and willing to work. You know, he was never lazy and he always had to get it out the mud. You know, he said he didn't grow up with no silver spoon in his mouth and everything was tough for him to get. And he was um, and it seems also too like, you know, he didn't mind, you know, being up under AZ and, and you know, being helped by AZ. Because a lot of men have an ego and a lot of men are arrogant and they want to be the guy. But Alpo stated that he was willing to work with AZ and, and, and come up that way. All right. So next, you know, what begins to happen is AZ spots, they keep getting robbed by these gangsters in New York because what would happen is, is these guys will have multiple storehouses where they would be, you know, trapping out of or so-called distributing the drugs. And, you know, a lot of the, the people that were buying the drugs, whether they were dealers themselves or they were users, they was always around these trap houses. Just like if you ever see New Jack City. There was always dope fiends around, you know, waiting for the dope. And a lot of times they'll be lined up down the street. So these spots were being robbed a lot because there was a lot of attention. And AZ started to get a little bit tired of that. So it got to a point where Alpo realized that, you know, he had to get his own crew of hitters to defend the business. And eventually Alpo, you know, was given one of these particular blocks by AZ to hold down. So Alpo got the block now, you know, and. According to Alpo, he said he still was, you know, breaking AZ off um, a couple of bands on each brick because he didn't have his own plug yet at this time. So AZ and Alpo still working together. And Alpo is, you know, building his business up, saving his own money up. So now he can buy his own keys and doesn't necessarily have to get them from from AZ. So eventually what happens is, is um, Alpo meets his own connect. You know, he's still working. So now he has that direct plug, you know, to the cocaine. So he doesn't necessarily need to get it from AZ. But they were still cool. So AZ and Alpo, you know, they basically were their own bosses, but they were working together, you know, and this is how their relationship or their, you know, partnership was. So we all know about, you know, in the movie Paid in Full, we see the scene where where Alpo saves Richard Porter from, you know, some guy in jail that's trying to press him by the, by the phone. And, and, you know, and, and, and Alpo stabbed the guy up or whatever. But it just tries to show you how Alpo and Richard Porter started to get cool and they started to create their own little relationship. And it appears that that's what happened in real life as far as like them started to create their own relationship and get cool after Richard Porter had come home for prison. And he may have gotten caught with like a pistol or something like that. And he had to do a little bit of time. But eventually when he got out, that's when, you know, AZ was on the streets and they was all doing their thing and they all began to run together. Um, Al Poe, Rich and AZ So they were all working together But they were their own boss Like nobody was really working for the next man They were all working together You know, so it probably was times Where they may all put their money together To get, you know, one big boatload of bricks But then they would break them all down And, you know, and each man would do his own thing But nevertheless, they still were moving as a team You know, defending each other And there to support each other Through that dirty game in the streets So as all the money is coming in You know what I'm saying? You got the new cars the new clothes, the women, just like it showed you in Paid in Full, they in the clubs. You know, they had, you know, Cameron playing Alpo, you know, with the with the champagne bottles, you know, with the Gucci and the Versace robe and stuff like that. It does seem like Alpo was that type of brother for real in real life. You know, just fly, charismatic, you know, and um, had a type of energy that could attract the people, you know, made a lot of jokes and stuff like that. So people like to be around this guy. So, you know, what started to happen is, is, um, you know, the money's coming in and Alpo seems to be he, he seems to me at least to be a, an adventurous type of guy. So although they were living in New York, living in Harlem, but, you know, a lot of guys were landlocked. They didn't necessarily leave New York or leave Harlem or whatever borough or area they were from. And this is according to Alpo. He said Rich didn't really want to leave Harlem like that. 
So it would be certain events going on out of town and the Alpo would want to pull up. Like, for example, they would have those bike weeks down in like Myrtle Beach, uh, Virginia Beach, certain places down south where you would have the brothers pulling up with their bikes. Because like in Paid in Full, you know, it did show you that uh, Cameron or Alpo's character, he was into the motorcycles and stuff like that. So when you had these different events, you know, out of town, seems like Alpo and a couple of his guys may have pulled up, you know, just to see what's going on. And this was around like 1986, 1987. So at this time period, Alpo would have been getting ready to go into his early 20s, you know, leaving his teenage years, going into his early 20s. OK, so we also want to look at the time period. So in the late 80s, you know, he was in his early 20s. So, you know, they out of town, Virginia Beach. And when you're going out of town and you go into these events, you know, people seeing what you're wearing, they seeing, you know, and then the way Alpo and these New York guys was coming, they had a lot of the Gucci and certain custom designer material and clothing that Dapper Dan was creating for them. I believe the guy's name was Dapper Dan and other fashion designers around New York. So when these brothers were going out of town, you know, the people in other cities would notice them. And then they pulling up in these fly cars and then they were young. Remember, like I said, these guys was in their teenage, late teens, mid teens, early 20s. So you can see them coming a mile away. So at Virginia Beach, Alpo states that this is when he began to meet a couple of women. And these women were from Washington, D.C. All right. These women were from Washington, D.C. So when he's meeting these women from D.C., you know, he goes back to New York and then these women will come to New York to hang out with him in New York. So they hang, they, you know, they meet him and AZ and Richard Porter and they bring in a group of girls from Washington, D.C. So, of course, they in New York and they saying, man, these dudes really doing it up here. Like they got the cars, the clothes, the money's coming in. So they seem like, dang, this dude Alpo really making moves up here in New York. Right. So eventually, you know, the women go back home to Washington, D.C. And then they invite Alpo and Richard Porter to come down to Washington, D.C., but Alpo states that basically he pulled up by himself. OK, so now you got Alpo going into Washington, D.C. to hang with some of the women that he met, you know, when he was going out to Virginia Beach and, you know, some of these other gatherings. And he's now starting to learn the D.C. streets. You know, he's starting to see how vicious D.C. is. You know, the women that he was dealing with. You got to remember, like, if they were attracted to Alpo when they met him, that means more than likely back in D.C. They were dealing with them same type of guys, gangsters, hustlers, street guys. You know, dudes that had the nice cars and the nice clothes and stuff like that. So back in D.C., you know, those women were plugged in with those type of guys. So when Apo got to D.C., you know, he's trying to learn the land um, and he's not coming in with much arrogance. You know, he's trying to peep the scene because he sees that these dudes in D.C. not playing no games. Like he saw how quick they were to murder people and it was just a vicious cutthroat game. So. Alpo did just go in there with guns blazing and just taking stuff over because them dudes in D.C. would have knocked Alpo off quickly. You know, it seemed like he came in um, and got in where he could fit in and try to learn the situation and learn the personnel and learn who he was around. Now, there was a gentleman by the name of Red Jack that I think he may have been a little bit older than Alpo. But anyway, he was already down in Washington, D.C., you know, involved in certain, you know, activities in the streets. So he already had a face card down there. So he was able to let the people in D.C. know, at least in the streets, that no, nah, Alpo is good. Like, I know little bro from back in New York, face card A1, like he ain't on no BS or nothing. Like, you know what I'm saying? He probably down here to get some money. So, you know, work with the guy. So Alpo was already tied in, you know, in D.C. And, you know, he went out there just like some um, rookie. You know, he already had brothers in the streets and he also had these women that were out there. So now he's in D.C., you know what I'm saying? And, um. He's learning the streets. He starts to begin into, you know, the drug game a little bit more so on the wholesale aspect of it, because up in New York, remember, they were dealing with those bottles like they showed you paid in full. But that can be very, very tedious. You know, imagine having, let's say, you know, I'm gonna just make up a, num a number, 100, 200, 300 bottles and you're taking a whole key of cocaine and breaking it down. You know, that's a lot of time. You know what I'm saying? And then in order for you to make the money back like you want, you know, you really can't afford to lose any of these little bottles. So that was very, very tedious, according to Alpo. So when he got to D.C., he basically said he wanted to get into the wholesale business. You know, he got the whole brick, you know what I'm saying? So he just market up a couple of thousand and then sell it and get it off and be done with it. You know, and he said that's that's the style that he wanted to do, because all that hanging on the block like they were doing in D.C. He's, I mean, up in um, New York, he said he had just gotten a little bit tired of that. So now Alpo is down in D.C. 
You know, for example, he said he would go down there with like 30 bricks and then he would sell all of them in one day. You know, so according to, you know, Alpo, like he was getting between, let's say, six thousand and about twenty five hundred in profit per brick. And what happens is, is that the reason why the profit would go from six thousand to about twenty five hundred, three thousand is just competition. So now, you know, you got other people coming in with the bricks in order for you to get yours off. What you're going to do is you're going to decrease your price. So Alpo was saying that, you know, for example, if guys in D.C. were selling their bricks for like twenty one thousand, then he would undercut them and sell his for like eighteen thousand. OK, so you can see how he was getting these bricks off real quick. And then he had plugs. He was tied into guys who was already willing to spend two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand, four hundred thousand. So it was nothing for him to get it off. You know what I'm saying? So while he was in D.C., um, there was also another man by the name of Rafael Letman. A lot of you all may have heard of him before, but basically he was like the top kingpin in D.C. when it came to the drug game. And he was already up and doing his thing down there before Alpo came. And you know, from what it looks like, it seems like Ray Follettman was like at a real, real high level. So it wasn't like, you know, he saw Alpo as some type of competition or something because I think Ray Follett just had his thing on so much on, on lock that, you know, he was good with his own operation. And then eventually, you know, Ray Follettman ended up getting locked up because the feds were on him. OK, it was a lot of murders going on and stuff like that. And, um, you know, Ray Follett Ray was, you know, he, he had a lot of people hit. So eventually the federal government caught up with him. And when, and when Ray Follettman goes to jail, this now allows Alpo to, you know what I'm saying, become more financially profitable. Because now if the main man is gone, they got a lot of the bricks that people are going to be looking for. OK, well, you know, who, who who's the next man that has them available? And then you got Alpo there with all these bricks from New York. And then he got a good ticket. So Alpo now is, you know, he, he, he he's selling more bricks in, in D.C. He's doing his thing. And he starts to put his own team of D.C. hitters together because something that Alpo was very wise about. And I heard him say he said whenever he would go to an area, whether it was in New York or in D.C., he said he would never bring like guys with him that were from another area. So let's say if he was in, you know, I'm going to just make something up like he may have been somewhere, let's say Harlem, right, doing business. So instead of him bringing, let's say, guys he knew from another area to do business in that area, which would create a lot of violence and a lot of tension with other guys, he would just hire and put guys on that were from that area, okay, and let them eat. So it doesn't look like Alpo was selfish when it came to that. And when he was in D.C., he did the same. Like, he could have easily just brought a bunch of guys from New York down there and just tried to put them on and take over. But, you know, you're not going to go to no other man's city, especially in the underworld of the streets, and bring your whole crew from another state and think you're going to take over. Like, that's just not about to happen. So what Alpo did was a lot of these killers and hitters in D.C. that people were afraid of, he started to empower them and put them on his crew. And one of these men were uh, Wayne Perry, if you ever heard of Wayne Perry. Now, the way he met Wayne Perry, um, he had a young guy that he was dealing with, and this young guy's uncle was cool with Wayne Perry, but at the time, Wayne Perry was actually locked up for something he had done. And I think he had a bond or a bail, and neither he didn't have the money to get out or nobody he was affiliated wanted, wanted to get him out. Because according to you know a lot of background information, Wayne Perry was a very, very notorious killer. And it seems like you know his ethics of killing you know, put fear in other people. So Wayne Perry was like stabbing and kidnapping and you know, he was kind of at another level with it. And he probably was giving a lot of folks headaches that was from D.C. So when he was locked up, you know, it, it, certain people was cool with that. Because if he was on the streets, he probably would have given them hell. So, of course, Alpo being a chess master, being the Kaiser Soze of the, of the dope game, he saw that, well, if I get this guy Wayne Perry out, you know, put him on, you know what I'm saying? Put some money in his pocket, you know, some cars and stuff and, and prop him up. Then he can be on my team and help with the enforcement and he always he already has a notable rep in D.C. So these guys already know what Wayne Perry is about, because at the time, some of these D.C. guys started to look at Alpo like, look, bro, we finna rob you and get you up out of here. So it was a time period where Alpo said a guy tried to um, actually set him up and backdoor him and he ended up getting shot in his ribs. And at this time period, he realized that, you know, OK, this is now when I need to activate Wayne Perry and put him on the forefront because 
you know, after he bonded Wayne Perry out, you know, he knew this guy's reputation. So it wasn't like he was trying to get too, too, too close to Wayne Perry because Wayne Perry could have backdoored him. So and also another thing that he was smart to do is not to let Wayne Perry fully, fully, fully know everything about his operation. You know, where all his work is stored at and stuff like that, because at the end of the day, you know, he doesn't really fully know if he can trust Wayne Perry. But anyway, you know, eventually he, he lets Wayne Perry in and they get a little bit closer so they can, you know, he could be protected while he's doing business in D.C. Now, when things started to take a turn a little bit, because as we all know, in the streets, you know, everything that glitters in gold and the good times don't last forever. But back in New York, you know, Richard Porter, he's still doing business up there. But I believe Richard Porter had a cousin that was, you know, he was in the streets as well. And there was some work that Richard Porter wanted Alpo to front one of his cousins. According to Alpo, it was like 125 grams. And Alpo agreed to do it, you know, and he said his cousin came, you know, and got the, the work from him down in D.C. or whatever. But what happened was his cousin eventually ended up getting pinched and he got caught by the federal government. And in order to get himself out of trouble, you know, according to Alpo, at least, it seems like maybe Rich Porter's cousin you know, kind of embellished on his relationship with Alpo and made it seem like Alpo was this super plug. And now the federal government is aware of who Alpo is because prior to this, I'm not sure if they were too aware of who he was. All right. So the first thing you got to, you know, note on is that maybe one of Rich Porter's cousins or one of Rich Porter's affiliates told on Alpo. And now this is why Alpo kind of had to be on the run because he got this federal warrant out for him now. All right. The next thing I want you to think about is this. So in Paid in Full, they show you that part where Alpo character, you know, kills Money Mitch, right? Because it's a scenario where Money Mitch's younger brother, Darnell, gets kidnapped by some of these hitters up there in Harlem. And there is a ransom. So at the time, you know, in the movie, at least, they try to show you Money Mitch trying to get his brother back. And, you know, Alpo finds out about it. He finds out that Money Mitch has some extra bricks or some money maybe that he wasn't aware of. And next thing you know, he he shoots, you know, Money Rich and uh, Money Mitch, rather, excuse me. Then, you know, he scratches him in the face or at least in the movie. This is what it shows. But according to Alpo, the story was different in, in real life. According to Alpo, back up in New York, in Harlem, rather, he said he had his own connect that was a young Dominican guy. And he was working with this guy, but sometimes this guy didn't have enough work to front them because in the streets, you know, sometimes you may not have three hundred or four hundred thousand to give the plug up front. So what they would do is, is they would front you the bricks and either you would give them a percentage of the money up front or maybe they were so cool to say, hey, well, just give me all the money on the back end. All right. So that seems to be, you know, part of the um, business model in the drug game, you know. It's back then and probably even now. So, you know, you would have this plug you would meet and they would be so on and had access to so much work that they could actually afford to front you 100, 200, 300 kilograms and, and you ain't even put no money up. So Alpo had a plug like that, but it would be times when maybe the guy didn't have enough resources to give Alpo. At this time, you also have to remember that you know, Money Mitch is in, in New York. He's doing his own thing and he got his own plug because remember, Alpo had his own plug. Money Mitch had his own plug. AZ had his own plug. But if there will be times where let's say one plug didn't have any work, then one of the guys may go do business with his partner's plug. So if there was a time where let's say that, you know, Alpo needed some work or it was a time, let's say that Rich needed some work, but Rich's plug didn't have it. He would go to Alpo's plug and get some of the work from him. Right. And the way it would happen is, is that let's say if he gave um, you know, rich 60 bricks or 100 bricks, then half of those would go to Alpo and then half of go half of those would go to, to rich. All right. So that's how the setup was. And let's say that, you know, if Alpo's connect gave rich some bricks, let's say he gave him 60 bricks for 12,000 a piece or 11,000 a piece. That means that rich would give, you know, his money at 11,000 a piece. And then Alpo would give his money at eleven thousand a piece, and this is how the plug get his money back. Then they would get it, and then they go in and they upsell it, right? But what would happen is, is that instead of selling the bricks to Alpo at the same ticket that Rich got him from the plug, 
Rich would upcharge Alpo and then had Alpo think that it was coming from Rich's plug, but really it was coming from Alpo's plug. So imagine this. Alpo plug giving them for 11000 okay? But Rich plug may have been giving them for, let's say, fourteen. Rich gets the, the 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 bricks from Alpo's plug and pays eleven, but he goes and gives them to Alpo and tells them they came from his plug and they for fourteen. So that extra three thousand in profit, Rich Porter was pocketing that, okay, and he actually was deceiving and he was lying to Alpo. All right, now you got to remember if these guys are supposed to be cool and they all do a business in the streets together, you're not supposed to lie to your guy like that. You know that's that's deceptive. You know what I'm saying? And that, that's a lie, you know. Why would you do that? We all get money. So it gets to a point where it's, it's, is it greed? Like, you know, what is it? And eventually, you know, Alpo caught wind of this. You know what I'm saying? And he said he was very hurt when he caught wind of it. And he really couldn't believe that Rich was doing him like that. And it took him a little while to process it. And he didn't initially act on it. You know what I'm saying? Because, you know, he had been moving and rolling with Rich for a while. So... I guess he had to really rethink really about it. So back down in D.C., Alpo was, you know, doing business down there. But you got to remember, he had his own crew of people down there. He had his own team of people that he was dealing with. He had D.C. shooters, D.C. hitman, D.C. distributors that he was selling to when he was doing his wholesale business. So there was a guy by the name of Little Gary down there in D.C. And, you know, Little Gary was getting money. Little Gary was already, you know what I'm saying, up, doing his own thing. I think he was buying bricks from Alpo, maybe. And they, you know, began to get tight. You know what I'm saying? According to Alpo, he said him and Gary were like, you know, how he was with Mitch in New York. He said that's how him and Gary were down there in D.C. So they were pretty cool. So anyway, um, you know, Alpo, you know, starts to tell Gary about what's going on with Rich. And Gary had met Al, um, Rich before because Gary would come up to New York sometimes and hang out with, you know, Alpo up in New York. And then, of course, Alpo would introduce him to the guys that he was, you know, grew up with up there in Harlem. So I'm pretty sure that Gary had met M Mitch before. So when he found out about what was going on, you know, Gary wanted to go ahead and kill, kill, kill Rich. But Alpo was like, no, nah, we got to wait because I want to give this guy a, a chance to actually tell me the truth. And what happened was is he, he actually finessed Alpo again. So Alpo tested him again and he finessed him again. So that means he probably got fronted some more bricks and then, you know, lied to Alpo again, right? Now, the way Alpo initially found out about all this is because that Dominican plug he had, Alpo ran into him one time being up there in New York. Because remember, if Alpo is doing business and he's living in New York, I mean, living in D.C., that means that a lot of these bricks that the that his plug, you know, is giving him for the 11000 He's probably giving them to Rich. And then Rich is meeting up with Alpo. And then Alpo is getting them from Rich. So the plug, the Dominican plug, he's not really seeing Alpo enough to where he could just directly give Alpo his own bricks. So this whole time, the Dominican plug in, in, in Harlem, he thought that Alpo was getting his bricks for the 11000 and everything was cool. But Alpo made him aware, like, man, you know what's going on? Like, you upcharging me? Like, dang, you ain't fronting me no more. And his plug in Harlem basically told him, like, no, nah, I've been fronting you. Like, I just gave, you know, saying Mitch, you know, 60 bricks at 11,000 or whatever. And then he described how the bricks look. So this is how Alpo was able to confirm, like, dang, bro, really is, you know, finessing and two-timing me. Like, he jugging me on the bricks. Like, he ain't even really have to do it like that. Like, you getting them from my plug. And, and, and Alpo even said that he understood that when Rich was getting the bricks from his own plug, if he upsold them for like another thousand or two, he said he didn't really mind, you know, Rich making the money. But when you getting them from his own plug and you still doing it and you lying, that's when that's when Alpo Alpo felt tried then, you know. And you know, as I said before, in the streets, when it comes to like morals, principles, integrity, that stuff is very very big, and you have a small margin of error when it comes to that disloyalty. And you also got to remember this, too. Your reputation is everything. So if he's two time at Alpo. How do we know that maybe Money Mitch could have been bragging about? Yeah, I finesse Alpo X, Y and Z. So now Alpo looking weak to other dudes in New York. And now they may think that they can try Alpo. So that's another dangerous thing in the streets that a lot of times, you know, when certain things happen. 
you got to defend yourself in a certain way because if your reputation get out that you weak and anybody can try you, then you can end up in certain situations. You know what I'm saying? Uh, this is also happens in the county jail, in the federal prison and in the state prison itself. You know, on a small level, I had an experience like that in the county jail. You can have a situation where, for example, like. One time I was in a county jail and I don't I don't eat certain food, you know, I don't eat beef and I don't eat pork. So when they were coming out and they would serve us these pork chops or these hamburgers, I didn't eat that. You know, I may eat the vegetables and the cornbread or the mashed potatoes or the french fries or whatever. But the burgers, I was always looking to trade that. So it may be a situation where we all in the hall eating and it may be a guy I want to trade with. Right. And let's say I'm going to trade him two burgers and he's going to give me, let's say, three honey buns and a couple bag of chips. Right. But his honey buns and his chips and the food that he has it may be locked in the cell, but we all in the main hall eating. So I go ahead and give him the hamburgers now. And then I'm expecting him on the back end when they when they pop the cells back open and everybody go back in their room that I'm going to go up to his cell and then he's going to give me the chips and the honey bun. I go about my business. But if this guy decides to renege on that and then everybody in the dorm see me just get tried. Now I got a problem on my hands. You see, so this type of stuff can happen. And I remember my situation, you know, it was it was actually it was it was exactly that. Um, I traded the guy, the hamburger, big, a big defensive end looking guy too, big Georgia cornfield fed, cornbread fed. You know what I'm saying? Life looking. You know, I remember how life was like them type of niggas in the state of Georgia prison uh, and county jail. But, you know, when they popped them open, you know, I immediately went right back up to bro because, you know, once again, I know what time it is. You know what I'm saying? And then he went on hand deal what he was supposed to do. Good business and you know everything was good So This is the kind of the situation that Alpo was in So he knew he had to do something So eventually what happens is Is that you know They 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 say Look we're going to get rich in the car And I'm going to ask him one more time And if he lies you know what I'm saying I'm going to have little Gary shoot him And basically they got Alpo You know Alpo's driving uh, They go pick Rich up they ask him again and, and Rich says the wrong thing. You know, he deceives him again and he lies. And next thing you know, Alpo gives the signal and then little Gary shoots Rich in the head like once or twice. OK. And then they go and dump. Um, they dump um, Money Mitch's body. All right. They, they dump his body. So, you know, this is ultimately that situation with that. So in Payton Ford, they make it seem like, you know, like Alpo was just this slime ball, you know, slimy person and all that. And, you know, you can have your own opinion, your own perspective. But but me understanding the streets and just how things go, I wouldn't necessarily say that Alpo was that, you know, because I'm wondering, like, damn, Mitch, why did you why did you two time him like that? Why you jug your own guy? You know, because up until that, like, you know, I mean, I don't know if Alpo had done something to him and he was retaliating. But nevertheless, man, like he, he, he shouldn't have done Alpo like that, you know. So if Alpo took it there and, you know, and, and, and had the guy assassinated, then, you know. You can look at that how you want to look at it. So, you know what I'm saying? Moving on, um, Money Mitch is dead. And now it gets to a situation, of course, you know, where, where and I'm going to probably talk about this in another video, where, where Money Mitch's brother, Darnell, gets kidnapped by that dude, Preacher. His uncle Apple and there was another guy involved with it as well. And these were some like older gangsters. Like you got to remember like Alpo and Rich and them, they was like in their early 20s. But Preacher and these other gangsters that they was dealing with, these guys probably was maybe in what, their 30s and 40s. So, you know, they, they kidnapped his brother and held him for ransom. And then eventually they killed um, Rich's younger brother. All right. So what ultimately ended up happening is... um. And, and, and as I said, I may go into this on another take, but Apple had to end up killing little Gary, the same guy that helped him kill uh, kill um, Money Mitch. And remember, Gary was known to be getting money on his own down there in D.C. But according to Alpo, he said he started to feel like a little bit of disdain from Gary. Um, you know, call Alpo's wife the B word and certain other little things and. You know, Gary may have started to show a little bit of resentment for whatever reason. But the true question you want to ask yourself is, is that, well, 
if Alpo had little Gary killed, but why? You know, was was little Gary jealous of Alpo? Um, Alpo stated that little Gary started to do passive aggressive stuff towards him. So what eventually came down is, is that Alpo had a deal. And this is according to Alpo. Now, he said he had a deal for like six million on some coat. And he said he had to put up one point five to get the coat. But he got word, you know, saying from somebody in prison that had told one of Alpo's associates that Gary was planning on robbing him and killing him. And this associate told that information to Wayne Perry and then Wayne Perry told Alpo. So now Alpo is in a position where he's like, damn, like I got this six million dollar play. And now my main shooters, you know, which was Wayne Perry and this other guy, they come to tell me that word is through the people in prison that Lil Gary bragging about. He going to backdoor me and take the, the money and the bricks from me. So now Alpo is in a funny situation. You know what I'm saying? He's in a real, real funny situation. So, you know, when you're in the streets, you, you really can't afford to, um, like I said, that margin of error is very, very small. Dudes will backdoor you, etc. And then you got to remember, too, you got to remember these guys age. These dudes was in their teens and their early 20s. So they're emotional. The frontal cortex of their brain isn't that developed. Their entire brain isn't that developed. So it's very, very easy for them to make poor decisions. OK, so this is a lot of what was going on. And eventually what happened was, is that, you know, Alpo starts to think that, damn, like little Gary's anger towards him is growing and like, bro, really going to attempt to rob and kill me. So Alpo plans to take out little Gary. So Alpo, Wayne Perry, the guy who informed Wayne Perry and some other people basically got little Gary in the van. And ultimately, little Gary is shot in the head twice. All right. And then little Gary defecated on himself. And then eventually they, you know, they had to take little Gary's body and they dumped him in the woods, I believe. All right. So, you know, Alpo had a lot of um, he had a lot of a lot of crazy, you know, saying situations he was in crazy, maybe to somebody on the outside. But, you know, in the streets, that stuff is quite normal and you have to make those very, very tough decisions. And, you know, end up, like I say, killing people you close to. Don't know who to trust, so you got to make the move first before they get you, etc. That's why if you're not willing to play that game and you're not willing to take them risk, don't be involved in the streets at all on no level, okay? Because you can't be emotional in the streets at all. So as far as with Alpo, as I said, you know, um, through 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 Richard Porter's cousin being caught, you know, on that play for that 125 grams, the federal government was already watching him. And the federal government, you know, the, the, the authorities in Washington, D.C., they were corresponding with the authorities up there in New York. So they see all these murders piling up. And eventually, you know, the, the finger starts being pointed like at this guy, Alpo. OK. And eventually what happened was is Alpo was charged. You know, he 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 admitted to 14 murders, um, basically. And he was sentenced to life in prison. But in order to relieve himself. The government really wanted to get Wayne Perry because they knew that Wayne Perry were behind a lot of these murders. Something else I noticed, too, is that the federal government already know that these drugs are being sold and being distributed. They already know that people are overdosing and dying on it, etc. But when it comes to these killings and these murders that surround the drug game in the streets, that makes it hard, you know, for the money flow and for business. And then it's not, excuse me, it's not good publicity. Because now those other Caucasians that live in the area, now they start worrying about stuff that's going on. Like if you hear about some guy that was murdered, you know what I'm saying, in, in a couple of blocks away or something, you know, now the police, the police will get more complaints. So now they got to do something about it. That's why it's not good for business when these murders start happening, because that's usually when the police start cracking down. But as far as the drugs being sold, you know, I can remember... Um, this guy may have been either the prosecutor or he was he worked for the government when when Nicky Barnes was being prosecuted. But he was saying like during the 70s, like the, 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 the guys would just be on the corner selling the streets and would see the police and basically flip the bird to the police and keep selling drugs. And the police were just going about their business. So, you know, but when, but when these murders happen, that's when they got to crack down, you know. So when those murders start happening, they had to crack down. 
And they were looking at Alpo, according to Alpo, they were saying, look, man, we're looking at giving you like not only life, but the death penalty. So you're going to have to give us some information that's of value. You're going to have to admit to everything that you did. You got to tell us about things that we do not know. And you got to give it all up. And if we find out about anything that you withheld, we're going to take the deal back and you have to do your full life sentence. And I post stated like, you know, he said, man, I couldn't I couldn't do I couldn't do life in prison. You know, at that time period, I think he said he was like 25 years old. He said he wasn't finna do that. So him being the Kaiser Soze of the dope game, you know, he gave them the, the big joker that they wanted, which was Wayne Perry. All right. And ultimately, you know what I'm saying? Wayne Perry got sentenced to life. All right. So Alpo, you know, eventually he ended up getting out of prison, but he was killed, I think, at what, 3.30 a.m. on October 31st, 2021. I found it very, very interesting that he died at 3.30 a.m. on October the 31st. So was this, you know, some Freemasonry? Was this the government? Was it the streets? Was somebody retaliating from Alpo's past? Did he get killed over something with a female? We don't necessarily know. But what we do know is that the brother died um, around the age of 55 years old. You know, so that's the story of, um, you know what I'm saying, my boy Alpo, man. Rest in peace to him. You know what I'm saying, real New York legend. Um, and you can learn a lot from a lot of Alpo's interviews. You know, he's a very, very detailed man. Um, and, you know, he just got some good insight on stuff. You know, he's a great storyteller as well. But this is Green Box Politics, Episode 3. Alpo Martinez, salute. Stay tuned. We out.